minutes in. Overall, the vibe, was it all a love fest for Luka Modric? I think from Real Madrid's point of view, yes. But there's another element to this, of course, which is the concerns about the way they played, the concerns about another away game, which they might not have won. And that Duvika's chance at the, at the very end could have taken the victory away from them. I think if you take, if you analyse the game as a whole, uh, I think there's concerns about how easy, well, maybe not easy, but how Celta were able to cut through the middle of Real Madrid, how they were able to find a lot of space. You you, you look at the, the, the goal that Svedberg scored and he's, he's all on his own. They, they, they cut Real Madrid open really, really easily there. And, and the concern about whether or not this, this kind of shift in formation is going to work. And we, we saw a real change, I think, today with Bellingham being slightly more over to the right. At times, instead of a back four, it was either a three or a five, depending on how you want to define it, with a two fullback stepping further up. And so, yes, the focus will be on Modric, who is the oldest player to have ever played for Real Madrid, comes on and almost immediately provides a brilliant pass for the goal. But there are other things that would worry Real Madrid as well. Very negative from Sid, considering Real Madrid going to get the victory. Yeah, but wasn't it nice, Sid, to see a team that are sort of mid-table actually take the game to one of the big boys in Spain? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Celta have been doing this all year, by the way. And, and Celta are very definitely a team that if they're on, you should watch them. They've played six times at home this season. They've only lost twice. Now, obviously, two out of six is quite a lot, but it's against Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid. And put simply, they were better than both of them. They, were, they will feel really, really hard done by to have not won either of those games. Only three teams have scored more goals than them. Only three teams have conceded more goals than them. Actually, it may have changed with tonight's goals. I'm not entirely sure. But obviously, they are a team that are well worth watching. They're a young team. They're a team full of youth team players. They're a team full of Galithians really trying to get their, their identity back. And, and it was interesting listening to you guys talk earlier about the shifting styles at Spurs and at West Ham and, and, and how there's an element of enjoyment. Well, that's very definitely the case here. This comes off the back, of course, of Rafa and it being a conservative team and a counter-attacking team, they're very, very different now and they're a lot more fun to watch. So, now, I know you've been struggling with your contact lenses, so I don't know how much you could see today, but we were talking about Jude Bellingham as we've, <laughs> we've seen quite a lot this season, cutting some, somewhat of a frustrated figure in parts of this game. Yeah, I think what we're seeing, of course, is... I, I mean, on the, on the one hand, what we're seeing is entirely natural. Um, and, and I think what we're seeing is a shift in his position and a shift in his role. Now, obviously, bear in mind that when he came in last season, none of us anticipated him playing this role as, uh, what you want to call it, top of the midfield diamond or almost a false number nine or a number 10 at least who's getting into the area, covering a lot of ground and scoring loads of goals. You know, He scored more than 20 goals last season in all competitions for Real Madrid, and that was his role. When you sign Mbappe, of course, you know that his position is going to shift. And at the start of this season, it was him to the left and him, Mbappe, Vinicius. The whole team was drifting to the left. Even Rodrigo, who nominally was the one on the right, was drifting to that side. And I think what we're seeing with, with, with Bellingham, of course, is, is a degree of responsibility for other parts of the game. And he hasn't scored yet. I think he's playing quite well. I think he knows that what happened last year wasn't going to happen again. But I do think there will be a degree of frustration. And as I say, I, I was quite interested tonight to see him playing to the right, which is another shift again in that formation, designed, of course, to accommodate other attacking players, which last year was him. And it was partly him out of circumstance last year. Bear in mind that he played that role because Mbappe hadn't come yet, because Karim Benzema had gone a year too early. So they didn't really have the number nine, apart from Rossellu, who was normally a guy that would come off the bench. And this year, they do. And so he's playing a different role. But I agree with you, at times we're seeing, we're seeing little glimpses of frustration. But I think he's, he's playing OK. And I think his, his athleticism is going to be really important in a team that otherwise runs the risk of, of, of I think, having a big gap between the defence and the midfield. Uh, sorry, between the defence and the forward line, which, by the way, I think is one of the reasons why they shifted the formation tonight. Uh, Classico, of course, next up for Real Madrid. Do you like this week, Sid, or is it the worst one of your year? <laughs> well, it's... It's enjoyable. It's exciting. It's, I mean, obviously, with, with Champions League as well, by the way, and it's not just with Champions League, but yeah. of course, you've got Real Madrid playing Borussia Dortmund. You've got Barcelona playing Bayern. So it's a real, you know, and I think this is one of the reasons why they both approached the international break the way that they did, which was we come back and we've got a week that does a huge amount to, to, to define our season. So, yeah, the Clasico week's the, the, the best week of the season, but it does tend to be quite long as well. Oh, oh he's got diddums. Wow. Oh, 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 he's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. One, he's got to do some work and he yeah. can't go to Oviedo. No, exactly. Hey, That's you, what it is. You exactly that. Get exactly your book to that. double figures, Sid. Uh, uh, Real Madrid then escaped back to the Spanish capital with three points, but boy, were they made to work hard for them. It is three points that puts them level 
with Barca at the top of the table. Barca, of course, in action tomorrow against Sevilla, looking to get a three-point gap ahead of El Clasico next weekend. Good game, Craig. Two moments uh, of brilliance. Mbappe from the mistake and the Luka Modric pass. Yep. And Real Madrid were not terrible, of course. There was some good play. There was the Bellingham chance. There were some others. But this was a proper game. You know, we sit here sometimes, when, particularly when Barca and Real uh, Madrid are playing and the other teams, the opposition, particularly as you go down the league, some sort of mid-table and below, uh, even at home, they just sit in, try to just hopefully just get a point or something on the break or a set piece. You know, and sometimes it can be quite dull to watch that. And obviously frustrating from uh, a Real Madrid and a Barca point of view. This was completely opposite. I just loved the approach from Celta Vigo. It didn't get them the three points, grant it, but it could have done. Mm. It could have done. They opened up Real Madrid several times. You saw the graphic there. They had uh, more efforts on goal. Uh, it was a really open game, and I also think that that made the spectacle, but it suited Real Madrid because there was a little bit of space for them to run in behind, hence the goal when it was scored by Vinicius, which was a straight ball for a diagonal run. The timing of the pass was perfect. The timing of the run was perfect because when it happened, I thought, oh, that's offside. Yeah. As the defender stepped out, as Vinicius was coming in, but everything was just timed perfectly. And we talked about Modric before the game, you know, breaking records, 39 years old. But what does he bring to the table? He brings quality in terms of the final pass. And we saw that today. That was the big difference between the sides. We were watching the game together and you mentioned Bellingham. Yeah, it's... Not quite happening for him. He was applauded in the second half. And I, I, I noticed this. When he went through that chance we saw in the clip, when he made that great run down the right-hand side, and he didn't have much support, as Shaq said, and he, and he just pulls the shot a bit wide, just, just a little bit. Ancelotti was out in the touchline applauding. Right. Uh, now, that's quite normal. You see that a lot, but you don't see it a lot from Ancelotti. And it almost said to me that this player's... A little frustrated, mm -hmm. lacking a bit of confidence at the moment because Mbappe's come in, he's scoring goals now, Vinicius is scoring goals. He was Jude Bellingham, that is, the big story last year. Every week, we sat here every yep. Saturday or Sunday, usually a Sunday, talked about Bellingham, talked about the goals, talked about scoring in the Classico, the winner, uh, talked about could he keep it up. He's kind of... We're not really discussing him as much these days. We're, we're, we're talking about... We're not talking about his, his influence and goals. We're talking about where's he going to play. Mm -hmm. Sid Lowe mentioned it at halftime. He was playing on the right side for, for a lot of the game, and it was a little bit different. But he just seems, and he'll probably say you know, to the media, no, no, I'm OK, we're winning games. But I think deep down there is a little frustration in there that thus far he has been... And by the way, this is not new to this start of this season. He was like this for England in the summer. Mm -hmm. He cut a very frustrated figure in the summer at the Euros with, I think, the tactics of England and some of his teammates. And I thought, at the time, I thought, it's just, it's just England. You know, Southgate is getting frustrated. And, but it, we've seen a little bit at the start of the season here, we've seen the frustration with some of his teammates. His performances have not been bad, but they're certainly down on last year. Uh, he'll be back, though, don't get me wrong. I mean, he'll be back. But I did think it was uh, noticeable that Ancelotti was out, almost trying to G this player up and say, you know, don't worry about it, keep going. But I thought... Give Celta Vigo the credit. I, at times, they, they wanted to put up, I think their first option was to pass the ball all to the back, and you saw a high press from Real Madrid uh, to start with as, as a result. But we've sat here time and time again, and this is not about La Liga, this is just about football in general, where you see lesser teams try to overplay in yeah. passing the ball out to the back. What Celta did was, you press too high, they're going to clip it in behind. And all of a sudden, I thought that caused Real Madrid a problem, as they weren't quite sure... They never fully committed to a, a very high press because they know that ball is in behind. And then as, as a result, they weren't able to get anywhere close and, and force the kind of mistakes, force the kind of turnovers you, you saw that at least, at least brought the, the opening goal with any kind of consistency. So give Celta, give Celta Vigo their credit for, for unsettling uh, Real Madrid in, in that way. And Real Madrid, of course, I'm going to see it this way, having somebody like Thibaut Courtois between the sticks, it proves how vital he is to their successes, even when he isn't making big saves. Mm. Just because he is such a presence, and I thought that had an impact on, on the result as much as anything. That save was very Emmy Martinez in the World Cup final, mm. wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes, yeah, that's the one you fell asleep during. Uh, just a reminder then, Larry.